Namaste to all. I hope everyone is keeping safe and well. This talk today has been organized by Shakti Shaka in South Harrow. Shaka is a branch of a UK charity, Hindu Swayam Sung, also known as HSS. The HSS endeavors to enable and inspire individuals to work towards the collective good of the world through Hindu thought and philosophy. As part of this, we've arranged this talk. We'd first like to wish you a very happy Makar Sankranti. We often make New Year's resolutions at this time also. Especially, we are often looking for ways to improve our health. How many of us have started a new routine, started a new diet, trying to get on top of all the stress and the tiredness of the last year. And we're also looking to get out of the states of disease and avoid getting diseases, as is the case in the world right now. Our topic today is Ayurveda, the science of life. Having been exposed to Ayurveda myself, I can vouch for its incredible effectiveness in de dealing with various ailments. So for this and our deeper knowledge on health, I would like to introduce Dr. Abhijit Ji Shinde. Dr. Abhijit is a founder and director of Ayurworld Health and Wellbeing Center. He's a senior Ayurvedic practitioner in Ayurworld, which is based in Hounslow. He has completed his master's of doctorate in Ayurveda Samiti from Pune in Bharat. He has learned Ayurvedic clinical skills in the traditional Guru Shishya culture with Vaidya Samir Jamat Agni, a renowned Ayurvedic physician in Bharat. Dr. Abhijit has 13 years of experience in Ayurvedic cl clinical practice. He was a lecturer in Ayurvedic Medical College, Wagoli in Pune. Since 2009, Dr. Abhijit is using his Ayurvedic clinical skills for the patients in the UK. So far, he has treated more than 13,000 patients with various health issues, including arthritis, eczema, psoriasis, anxiety, depression, sciatica, erectile dysfunction, diabetes, high blood pressure, frozen shoulder, just to name a few. He has a vision to promote Ayurvedic knowledge in the West. With this intention, he has started the Ayur World Academy under which he runs various Ayurvedic courses. He's also a member of International Ayurveda Academy, the Federation of Holistic Medicine and Therapies UK, and the Ayurvedic Practitioner Association, as well as a good friend of mine. For this talk, please keep yourself on mute. You're welcome to keep your camera on or off. Any questions you have, please enter them in the chat function and direct them at questions. And we'll take all the questions together and we'll try and get through as many as we can by the end. Dr. Abhijit's contact details will be again displayed at the end in case you wish, wish to contact him directly. Also, there will be details about HSS and our Shaka displayed at the end. Without further ado, I pass you over to Dr. Abhijit. Namaste everyone. And uh, thank you very much, Bhavesh, uh, to, uh, I mean, connect me with such a lovely audience today. Um, first of all, I hope everyone is safe and you all are keeping well. And if not, you must be looking forward to keeping well. And that's why I'm here. So don't worry. And uh, I wish all of you the happy Makar Sankranti. I mean, uh, look, such a, such a, a wonderful uh, day and the time it is, you know, yesterday, was the 14th of November and today I'm talking to you about the Ayurveda. I mean, it's just like in Sanskrit, we always call this as the Dugda Sharkara Yoga, when basically sugar comes along with the milk. I, I'm just feeling, uh, having the same feelings here when I'm talking to you today. Uh, today, basically, it's a challenge to me to talk uh, uh, in a, such a short time about the Ayurveda and that to like a science of life. I mean, it's, it's, it's a really challenge for me, like what to talk and what not to talk, but uh, I would like to keep it uh, very concise, very short and very simple so that uh, everybody understands really how, how beautiful this medical science is actually, and how we should not forget our, this uh, Ayurvedic uh, ancient medical science. Uh, 
first of all, uh, uh, I would like to uh, share my screen. Uh, I hope everybody can see my screen. Right, so see, today's topic is Ayurveda science of life, right? So when I say Ayurveda, actually what, what, what we understand, what, what is this Ayurveda? So it is a two words, There's a, there are the two words. First word is Ayu. Ayu means life, actually, Sanskrit, yeah, if you, I mean, many of you must be knowing like Ayurveda, it's, it's, it's a Sanskrit, basically, you know, uh, in that it is scripted. So Ayu means life and Veda, as we all know, means knowledge or the science. Okay. Actually, if you try and understand the Hindu culture and the history of Hinduism, or if you try and understand the India's Bharat's culture or Bharat's history, everything, all of our knowledge was based into this four Vedas, Rugved, Samved, Yajurved, and uh, Atharva Ved. Actually, Ayurveda is the Upaveda, or basically, you know, a small part of the Atharva Veda. Ayurveda itself is a big ocean, you know, like in which I'm still diving, in which I'm still basically, you know, trying to catch uh, and myself and understand myself and explore myself, many, many, many new things. I'm still learning Ayurveda. But imagine what that Atharva Veda must be, actually. So, it's just the sub, you know, one part of the Atharveda. What Ayurveda, which we know nowadays, what is scripted and what the books are available, it's hardly basically 30 to 40 percent. The 60 percent of Ayurveda is not available. Unfortunately, you know, it, this, all the basic scripts, they are not available with us. So if you go back and see the history of the Ayurveda, I mean, since how long this Ayurveda has come or since how long the Ayurveda has evolved, it goes back 3,500 years to 5,000 years, actually. So we are connected with 3,500 years of the history. And you must be wondering and you must be mesmerized to know, like, you know, how come this tradition or how come this practice is still alive? And how come basically I am an Ayurvedic practitioner sitting in 2021 talking to you about this? The reason behind that is the way the Ayurveda's basic principles are. Because the basic principles of Ayurveda, they are not based on any theory. They are not based on any, basically, uh, some basically assumptions. They are simply and simply based on one and only truth, and that is the nature. This is the beauty of these basic principles of the Ayurveda is. I would like to take you to the next slide, actually, which is the definition of the Ayurveda. But before that, you know, Ayurvedic basic principles are based on the nature. Till the time nature is going to be there, Ayurveda is going to be there, actually. And that's why Ayurveda is still there, right? We often like see Ayurveda as a medical science, or we often see Ayurveda as, okay, I have got something. Many clients, many patients, they come to me when they get something, they have the problem. Nobody comes to me and says, I mean, there are the people who come nowadays, but nobody comes and tells me, okay, Abhijit, tell me what shall I do for not getting the diabetes because I have the family history of diabetes and I would like to follow the Ayurvedic way. Because Ayurveda is not the, for only, you know, disease. Ayurveda is not only for condition. It is a lifestyle. Ayurveda talks a lot about what. So here we go, try and understand the definition of Ayurveda, and then you will come to know what actually Ayurveda is. Hita hitam sukham dukham ayustasya hita hitam mananchata chetraktam Ayurveda sa uchate. Now see this definition. It's a such a depth actually this definition is having hita ahita hita means basically what is hitkar to you what is good for you ahitkar that means what is bad for you now these two words basically is like so i mean uh, deep meaning this are having hitkar means it's not only for yourself it is for your health it is for your mind it is for your life it is for your every aspect of your life right from the childhood till the death, before the birth and after the death as well, for your career, for your uh, social life, for your family life, for your, uh, you know, talk, for your walk, for your daily uh, regime, for your seasonal regime, for your night regime, what is good and what is bad? 
hit what is hitkar what is ahitkar what is advantages what is disadvantages that is the meaning of hita hitam sukham dukham why we i mean what the world is going for i mean crazy for and why we live our intention is everybody wants to be happy everybody is looking for happiness like you know and that is what ayurveda explains in what actually the happiness lies so many times you know like i was listening the music music is my weak point so i was feeling happy so music makes me happy sometimes some people will feel, feel like okay making money makes me happy some people say like okay getting the position makes me happy but are these the really uh, real happiness they are not the real happiness that is the temporary happiness so what is real happiness actually ayurveda talks about that ayurveda gives the guidelines about that and ayurveda takes every individual on path of this happiness actually also it talks about the dukkha what will make you unhappy ayurveda makes you understand what you will you make you so you you need to refrain from that ayurveda gives all that guidelines so it's not only about the medicines you know it's not only about taking the herbs or the taking the massage as the western world <laughs> unfortunately understand it's not about that so hitam ahitam sukham dukham and ayushtasya hitahitam ayushtasya means to live a qualitative life and the long life how we should use this knowledge in our day to day life that is what the ayurveda is and the most important is the second line manancha tatcha yatruktam man man means what the measurement see we all want to be happy but how much i mean is there any parameter how much happy we want to be everybody says my you know you don't know what i am going going through you can't understand what stress i have or you don't understand what the uh, problems i have everybody thinks my problem is the biggest problem actually right there is the measurement and trying and understanding how much happiness how much hitkar how much ahitkar so that's what the ayurveda tells us actually and how it tells us it's not only by you know giving the knowledge about the body it gives us the knowledge about the mind now imagine whatever i have talked it's not the physical it's the mind as well you know so what is hitkar to the mind what is ahitkar to the mind what gives the happiness to the mind what gives the uh, uh, you know sorrow to the mind so and one level next it doesn't stops there ayurveda never stops there just the body just the mind the next and the most important stage is the atma ayurveda talks about the atma the soul so you can imagine ayurveda gives the inside out knowledge about the soul ayurveda gives the qualities of the soul ayurveda has described the qualities of the soul i mean this in the western world i have come came across a lot of anxiety and depression patients i mean there is no any single day when i have seen at least 8 to 10 patients in a day there are at least couple of patients with the anxiety and depression directly or anxiety induced pathologies like stress anxiety is there and psoriasis is there or stress anxiety is there and blood pressure is there or stress anxiety is there and insomnia is there so we all you know are finding it difficult to understand the mind psychological medical science or psychologist into the allopathic medical science they have achieved a certain level actually and i had a little bit uh, so many discussions with the psychologist and the way the the level which they have achieved the ayurveda talks much beyond that ayurveda talks about the mind i mean simply whenever i come across the mind question i always ask to my patients okay what do you think where is the mind and everybody thinks there that's into the head actually the problem is our mind is always associated with our thought process and we never basically think above our thought process we never connect our mind to our senses the real answer to this is mind is you know everywhere and it is always connected with our five senses this is very simple thing right but ayurveda doesn't stops there this is about the mind ayurveda gives this kind of the qualities of the soul ayurveda has described this so you can think this our ancient basically rishis ancient munis and all these scholars i always call them as a pure scientists because now the scientists have a lot of tools a lot of technology a lot of uh, you know things uh, methods to prove that i just get mesmerized like how these ancient rishis they must have uh, you know understood this soul ichha dvesha sukha dukha pratnas chetana dhruti 
these are the qualities they have described in charak sanhita uh, which is a very uh, ancient sanhita of the soul actually so these are the three levels of the ayurveda which ayurveda shows us the body the mind and the soul and whatever happens in all these three levels ayurveda takes us on this path so that is the real definition of the ayurveda is actually i like to go ahead what is the intention of the ayurveda now today for today's lecture i would like to take down from the soul to the little bit down to the mind and to the body because if i will start talking uh, about the soul then the whole lecture will be just the philosophical which i don't want to be much more philosophical i want to take your attention because we as a layman as a general people we understand much more about the body and we can understand little bit about the mind so what is the prayojana or what is the intention of the ayurveda so swasthasya swastha rakshanam and aturasya parimokshanam this is the most important prayojan what do you mean by that swasthasya swastha rakshanam those who are healthy we want them to be healthy that is swasthasya swastha rakshanam and aturasya vikar parimokshanam whoever is the atur whoever is disease whoever have got already the problems that their vikar their problems should we should parimoksha that means we should take them out of that so is the same thing is happening in the world right now isn't it whoever is healthy we i mean we are giving them the vaccine and we are preventing them at the moment and whoever has got basically some problems like the corona then we are treating them ayurveda has thought this a lot before you know and that is the main intention of the ayurveda and that's why i always say the day when i will get that you know in my clinic the patients and the, the whole day i will spend when with the patients coming like i am coming to you to not the get the disease i am not coming to you because i have got the disease when they, that day will come then i think you know whatever i want to give to the western world i have given that till that that time i want to keep giving the as much as i rather what i have understood i'm just waiting for that day and i'm sure that day will come when all of my patients will be, i will be seeing a day when they will say okay today i'm coming to prevent myself so ayurveda talks a lot about the prevention and there are so many things about the prevention into the ayurveda little bit i would like to take you back to this uh, you know how ayurveda developed and how ayurveda basically has come to this stage where where i am uh, you know uh, so fortunate to learn about the ayurveda so the first script what is available is called as the charak samhita which is 760 bc i mean that long it is uh, before it was scripted actually and when i said scripted actually ayurveda is has has come to this uh, stage with the dialogue method you know ayurveda was is never ever a simple book which you read and you understand and then you start practicing ayurveda is not like that and that's why i had to you know spend a lot of time with my guru uh, uh, with the Jama, samir jamadagni uh, bavesh mentioned his name into the lecture i mean introduction already so we have to understand the ayurveda with the dialogue method you know question has to be raised and you know answers needs to be given and whatever the questions are there that needs to be counter question as well that is how the ayurveda started actually so charak sanhita is that way it is the dialogue method and charak sanhita is basically charak was not only one person it was the basically sampradaya just like we are like you know the hindu swayam sevak sangha is there so charak was one sampradaya and the main person in that was the charak so he started expl- exploring the things if he started understanding the nature what is the nature is all about we are the part of nature we are not the different from the nature actually and being the part of the nature we have the same basic elements what nature is having so what is this nature is having nature is having the air fire water earth and space five basic elements being the part of the nature we have the five basic elements so all these basic principles are in this charak sanhita after that few many years like you know the shushrut sanhita or the shushrut basically he st- he added the surgical approach to uh, this charak sanhita was is uh, charak sanhita talks more about the herbals and the plant based basically you know the pharmacopoeia shushrut talks more about the surgical approaches you will be very surprised to know you can dig down to the researches as well you know the eye surgery is the gift of the actually shushrut he started the eye surgeries first and the eye surgeries are you know such a skillful surgeries now all over the world but he is the 
uh, you know, the pioneer of the eye surgeries actually. And there are a number of surgeries. Uh, there is one surgery called as the Kshar Sutra, is, uh, which we perform into the hemorrhoids or the facial line and no treatment actually. And we still perform it in a exactly way what Shishrut Sanita has meant, uh, mentioned in that way. It is not without any anesthesia. It is without any surgical equipments actually. It just gets performed with the simple thread and such a beautiful, skillful surgery Shishru Sanita has maintained and that is in 660 BC. Ashtang Rudai, that came into the 7th century and that is basically a combination of this Charak Sanita and Shushrut Sanita. So he took the best of Charak, he took the best of Shushrut and then he started giving that in a simple way. So I basically, I am a Shishya or I am a basically follower of the Ashtang Rudai basically. So whenever I do follow, because I am still the Mudmati, that means I am not that brilliant or intelligent to straight away interpret the Charak Sanita or Shushru Sanita. So whatever is easy, I'm trying to get it from there, but still, I'm still struggling to understand the Ashtang Rudai in depth. Later on, what happened is the Nagarjuna was one of the scientists and he started the iatrochemistry, which is the different and very beautiful wing of the Ayurveda. We know in a Western world, like Ayurveda is purely herb-based, plant-based, which is absolutely right. But that is not only the Ayurveda. Ayurveda is full of use of minerals. Ayurveda is full of use of metals as well, which we don't use into the Western world because of the laws and regulations. But in India and in other subcontinents, there are such a beautiful medicines which are available, which do have these contents. And there is a misunderstanding about these contents, like the metals are present and they are harmful to the body. Well, that is not at all truth. The research is done and there is a lot of research papers available all over the world as well. There are the particular methods in which these metals, they become easily absorbable to the body without the showing any detoxifying or sedimentary traces into the kidneys and into the liver. But if that's done in a wrong way, then that can be the harmful. But if it's followed correct way, then that is not at all the harmful. And I have seen the amazing cases which was created by Dr. Lakshmi Shankar Vas. He was a scholar of the Jamnagar University, Gujarat, and he treated many, many patients with the cancer and gangrene actually using the Rasa Ushadis. So I have seen myself. And then the last uh, basically book I would like to mention is the Madhav Nidan, which gives us the all the depth, in-depth uh, understanding about the diagnosis pulse diagnosis, which is very famous, the Nadi Pariksha. So we check the Nadi of the person, like, you know, simply putting the hands onto the uh, Nadi and then understanding uh, what is happening inside the body, which I will talk a little bit uh, 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 in the next slides. A uh, little bit of attention I would like to take uh, towards this, you know, common myths about the Ayurvedic medical science, like Ayurvedic treatments or medicines are out of date. Many people, uh, I do deliver the lectures on a different, different platform and many people do uh, tell me like, oh, come on, it's 3,500 years old and how come it is still, you know, like uh, effective here and it is out of date. So it cannot, it is not uh, basically possible. The thing is, as I said initially, the basic principles of Ayurveda are based on to the nature. We are part of the nature. Till the time nature is going to be there, Ayurveda is not going to be out of date. My guru, always used to say, you know, like if you are a pure Ayurvedic practitioner and if the Srishti is there onto the Mars, because Srishti is what it is, again, the air, fire, water, earth and space. So wherever these five basic elements are there, you can practice the Ayurveda. So in future, if the Mars will have the Srishti, Ayurvedic practitioner can go there and practice the Ayurveda because the basic principles are based onto the nature. Ayurveda is just the collection of home remedies, not at all. In fact, Ayurveda is such a beautiful and such a flexible medical science that using the home remedies, you can treat yourself. And using the minerals and metal remedies, you can treat yourself. It is having such a wide, basically, you know, varieties and scope. So that is the beauty of the Ayurveda. And it is not the drawback of the Ayurveda, actually. Ayurvedic medicines or treatments take time to treat. Well, real answer to that is, unfortunately, patients or clients, they approach the Ayurveda when they don't get the answer anywhere into the world. So they come into the chronic stage and they come for the chronic elements. That is the thing. That is the first important reason behind this. And second important thing is Ayurveda is not a symptomatic treatment pathology, uh, you know, like pathy. We don't treat your symptom. Simple example. 
I have seen the patient of the migraine coming in my clinic this morning. Patient was complaining about the migraine. What I gave them is basically to treat their digestive system. The patient Google, where she, she went into the home and she said, oh, you gave me Kuta Jarishtam, which is good for the digestion. So where is the medicine for headache? Ayurveda never treats the symptom. Ayurveda treats the cause. So the cause needs to be treated. And till the time the cause is present, the symptoms will keep erupting. That's why to treat the cause, it takes the time. So the real answer is actually from her digestive system, there was the problem. The vata was evolving and she was getting the uh, headache. So I uh, told her, take the medicines at least for three days. Give me a call after the three days. And I'm pretty sure she will feel all right. So this is why it takes time. But it's not true. I have seen in my practice as well, blood pressure coming down within 24 day, uh, hours, uh, bleeding, uh, uh, you know, like the piles settling down within 24 hours. So that is not true. It's just the myth. Ayurveda has been to treat the chronic elements only, not at all, not at all, actually. Ayurveda can treat basically many acute conditions, many, many acute conditions. And most common, actually, which are this, Ayurveda doesn't understand the new health conditions. Well, the problem is you need to try and understand the basic principles of Ayurveda. Ayurveda talks about the dosha. Ayurveda talks about the pancha mahabhut. The new conditions is basically, uh, I mean, I'll give a simple example. Crohn's is one of the conditions. I do see many patients coming with the Crohn's in which the bleeding does happens per rectum through the anal region, actually. And many patients think, oh, Ayurveda must be not talking about this. I mean, how come Ayurveda talk about that? It doesn't matter what condition you have or what condition you have been diagnosed by the allopathic medical science. If we understand you based on these five basic elements, air, fire, water, earth, and space, and what the imbalance is there in your body, then we will be able to treat that. And that is what we do in our patients. So it doesn't matter what new condition, what new diagnosis, what basically difficult name you come with me, uh, come to me with the diagnosis. I mean, many patients come with the hefty files of, you know, investigations and they go, no, go through the, uh, you know, uh, all of my reports first. Well, I have nothing to do with your reports. Actually, what I have to do is with you. I have to treat you. I don't need to correct your reports. I don't treat the reports. I treat the person in front of me, that body, that mind and that soul. So, that is what the difference of the Ayurveda is. Ayurveda means massage, which is the one of the, sometimes I like this and sometimes I hate this actually, <laughs> this myth. Ayurveda is not meant just by uh, just the massage. Ayurveda is much more actually, which I will talk, uh, you know, in a later on uh, into the next slides. And Ayurveda shows the placebo or pseudo effect, which is the another common myth, which is not because we don't understand Ayurveda, what the Ayurveda is. That's why people say like it shows the placebo effect. The Ayurvedic herbs, they don't work because of the ingredients into the Ayurvedic herbs. I will give you a simple example. We do use for the acid reflux, if someone has got what you do take is the Gaviscon or, or any uh, antacid. What I do use is basically the herb called Shatavari, which is nothing but the asparagus, asparagus soup you must be using. I do use the roots of that. I do have the powder of that. And another herb I use the Amla. Amla is basically gooseberries powder. So I mix that powder and I give. So that works as an antacid. How does that work? That doesn't work because of the chemical ingredients in that. If you go and check the laboratory uh, in, you know, uh, report in that, you will find some chemical ingredients. It doesn't work on that. Ayurvedic herbs works on its rasa. That means its taste. Madhur, Amla, Lavan, Katu, Tikta, Kashai. These are the six tastes. Whether it's sweet, whether it's sour, whether it's bitter, it works on that actually. It works on the virya. That means its potency what the herbs effect on your body is, whether it's hot or whether it's cold. And the vipak, this is the most important thing. Vipak means once you consume something, then after the process of digestion, what effect, effect it will show on your body. So Ayurvedic medicines work like this, which we need to understand. If we don't understand this, we will think Ayurveda shows the placebo effect. So that is not the fact actually. Some basic principles, which I am talking about again and again, you know, Tridosha and Panchakama, this uh, Pancha Mahabud, this is the base of the Ayurveda actually. Little bit introduction I would like to give you. I don't want to take you into the too much technical and difficult uh, words, Sanskrit words. As I said, like, you know, we are part of the nature. Never ever forget whenever the human being or the human individual have tried to prove ourselves, 
I mean, you know, clearer than the nature. Nature has always shown the impact of that. We should not forget. We come from nature. We go into the nature, actually. And in between, throughout the life, we are dependent on the nature, the air, the, uh, the water, the food which we do consume. We are the part of the nature. So we have this air, fire, water, earth, and space, five basic elements in our body. So what happens based on the weather conditions around us, based on what we do eat, based on our age, based on these factors, your status of the mind, these five elements, air, fire, water, earth, and space, they start showing some imbalance. I'll give you a simple example. Like I'm basically, you know, a, a, a pitta person. What do you mean by the pitta? Pitta means having the more dominant uh, fire element in my body. So if I eat the chili, if I will start eating the spicy food or the chili food, I will be the first person to react it very quickly. Whereas the vata person who is having the air more into the body or the dominant into the body, he will react to the chili very less. All right. And the kapha, which is the combination of water and earth. So if he is having the more water and the earth element, he will very less react to the chili. And that is how we are different from each other, actually. Someone is having vata more, someone is having pitta more, someone is having kapha more. So we all are not same. That's why if the for same problem, whenever the patient comes to us, whenever the patient comes to me, I need to evaluate out whether the vata is dominant, pitta is dominant, or kapha is dominant, and accordingly, I need to treat. So the blood pressure, for example, is very common. Diabetes is very common. Does Ayurveda give the same medicine for every uh, diabetic patient or uh, blood pressure patient? No, not at all. So we need to understand the constitution first. What is the balance? What is the imbalance? What is the diet? What is the lifestyle? What is the occupation? All these factors basically matter a lot. And then we choose the herbs and then we treat it. So that is what it is, uh, you know, just to make a little bit summary of this. So vata, pitta and kapha, this is such an interesting factor. Like in a family of four, the four people can have the different, different constitution, which is a fact. And that's why, you know, the mothers, whenever I do the family consultation, they come to me next day, secretly calling me, Abhijit, you have made my life very difficult because you have told my son to eat some, uh, uh, some diet, my husband to eat some other diet, my daughter to eat some other diet and she have told me to eat some other diet. How I want to manage? Well, that's the fact. That's my duty, responsibility to tell you. Uh, jokes apart, but I mean, I have experienced this. So next, most simple explanation I would like to give it to you. What happens when this vata, pitta and kapha uh, goes out of balance? Imagine a vata is going out of balance. So we do have, according to Ayurveda, seven basic channels in the body. All right, as you can see from the right hand side of the slide, I'll take my cursor just to make you understand. Rasa is the first channel, Rakta is the second, Mausa is the third, Meda, Asti, Majja, and Shukra. I would like to introduce you to all of you. Please try and understand this because this is not only uh, for the disease, this is for your well being as well. Whatever we do eat, basically, the nourishment flows through these channels. All right. Imagine vata is out of balance into the body. So vata will start flowing through the rasa, through the rakta, through the mouth, through the medha, through the asti, through the majja, through the shukra. What is rasa? Rasa is nothing but it's a lymphatic channel actually all over the body. What is rakta? Rakta means basically blood or the blood channel. Mausa means muscle channel. Medha means fat channel. Asti means bone channel. Majja means basically a nervous channel. Shukra means the reproductive channel. I will give take one simple uh, condition and I will explain to you. Rheumatism, I, I, I treat many of the rheumatic patients. What do they have symptoms? They come with early in the morning, stiffness into the hands, inflammation. And since ages I'm having this, so I'm onto the methotrexate. I need to go and get the injections done. It works for one year. Then again, I come into back into the problem. Resolve me. Do you know what I do? Very simple, and I explain this to everyone. If you know any rheumatic patients, please pass this message to them. What you need to try and make them understand is in their condition, actually, the vata is flare up, air is flare up, and there is something called as the arm. What is the arm? It is a sticky mucousy substance which gets produced into the 
digestive system and that starts flowing and when that comes into this channel asti channel rheumatism takes place so what needs to be treated does the bones and the joints they need to treat no i don't pay attention towards the joints what needs to be treated is the digestive system vata needs to be treated and arm needs to be treated and you will be surprised to know within a couple of days the years and years of the rheumatism patients they start feeling better just by treating the digestive system so cause is very important not the effect okay so every pathology takes place in a such a way ayurveda sees the pathology in a such a way and we treat every condition this way actually just to make you understand uh so ayurveda is very specialized i mean uh, medical science just to share with you i mean ayurveda is having this eight branches and uh, we do see the patients everyone does have the specialties in different different branches kai chikitsa is the medicine bala means basically pediatrics griha means basically the microbiology shalya is surgery urdhvanga which is the ent ear nose and throat drashta means the toxicology jara means rejuvenation and vrushana means aphrodisiac these are the eight main branches of the ayurveda and there are the specialties there are just like the allopathic medical science heart specialists are there or surgeons are there so we do have these specialties and we practice in our own specialties actually uh, just as an introduction uh, uh, i'm sorry i think it's quarter to 9 is it okay or uh, Do, do I need to just go a little bit fast? I mean, if you let me know how much time do we have? I think continue, Abhijit. Okay, thank you, thank okay. you, Bhavik. thank you. Definition of health, as you must be saying nowadays. Whenever I ask you, okay, what do you think? Like you know, what is the definition of health? We think taking the medicines. I am taking multivitamins first thing in the morning. I am healthy. I take vitamin D. I am fine. I am sorted. Nothing is going to happen to me. Well, that's not the definition of the health according to the ayurveda you know the thing is the real definition of ayurveda is this you see the tridosha vata pitta and kapha right the 13 agni in our body what do we mean by the agni the one and the most important agni is the jatara agni the appetite the hunger which we do feel that is the jatara agni and there are other other 12 types types of the agni which is little bit technical i don't want to take you in depth towards that but this 13 agnis three doshas vata pitta and kapha seven dhatus which i introduced you rasa rakta mans med asti majja and shukra three mala that means the three excretions out of the body purish means stool mutra means urine sweat means basically you know uh, sweda means the sweat this three purisha five senses our eyes our smell our uh, you know uh, 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 um, uh taste our feel uh, you know touch these five senses listening these five senses one mind and one soul okay see how many factors are there when this all the factors come in a balanced form that is called health so sama dosha sama agni sama dhatu mala kriya prasanna atmendriya swasta ityadi diyate that is what charaka says sama dhatu dhatu has to be the balanced sama dosha dosha has to be balanced prasanna atmendriya atma has to be prasanna man has to be prasanna five senses has to be balanced so if you see the real definition according to the ayurveda you must be thinking we all are actually diseased even i am diseased no one is healthy here isn't it no one is healthy here because how it's possible can you see how pure this definition of uh, healthy is so we actually you know we actually run to doctors or we run to any practitioners ayurvedic practitioner homeopathic bhavesh is a physiotherapist actually i have seen his beautiful work i mean he has treated so many patients uh, in our premises and they come to him when when they have got the problem when they, that's unbearable but actually this is the real definition of ayurveda uh, according of the health according to the ayurveda very very beautiful and very in depth definition and this is what we should be trying and doing ourselves so this physical and physiological some factors psychological factors and this spiritual factor and this is what the ayurvedic real definition of health is how we diagnose the different different things many patients they call me and say do you do blood test do you do x rays do you do scan then how do you know what what has happened to me okay so see 
Ayurvedic medical science is, is a more physiological medical science, actually. All right. I mean, part of Ayurveda is a medical science. Ayurveda is not the medical science, by the way. Part of the Ayurveda, which is a medical science, that I'm talking about that, is a physiological medical science. We understand the physiology in depth, actually. And we do see the patients majority with the three things, you know, as you can see here, the last thing, darshan, sparshan, and prashna. Darshan, visualize the patient. We need to see the patient, actually. Sparshan, we need to touch the, this patient, actually. What, does we, what do you mean by the touch? So, so two things are involved in that. Nadi Pariksha, which is the pulse diagnosis, and the Udar Pariksha, which is the abdominal examination. Pulse diagnosis itself is a such a uh, you know big topic, and I'm still exploring, I'm still learning. A lot of patients, they come to me just to uh, just because they know about my pulse diagnosis method. Uh, so what is the pulse diagnosis? Pulse diagnosis is the method, is like, you know, the artery, which is uh, like, you know, the radial artery, we palpate that and we try and understand what is happening with the vata, pitta and kapha in your body. Is this something magic or is this something like, you know, no, not at all. It is a pure medical science. A little bit introduction I would like to give you. We have three fingers, index finger, middle finger, ring finger. This finger stands for vata. This finger stands for pitta. This finger stands for kapha. So whenever I feel anyone's nadi, whenever I touch these three fingers on anyone's nadi, if the force of the pulse is more on this index finger, the vata is always out of balance or vata is dominant. The force is more into the middle finger, pitta is more dominant, and the force is more into the ring finger, kapha is more dominant. Simple equation. Again, this vata is of five different types, pranudan, van, samanapan. So we need to see whether this index fingers, which angle I'm feeling, based on that, I can diagnose which is the vata out of balance. Same with the pitta, same with the kapha. So this is the this is a basically practice. You need to see thousands and thousands of the nadis to understand in depth. And same way, we do the Udar Pariksha. So what we do, we palpate the liver, we palpate the spleen, we palpate the kidney area, and we palpate the area, which we call as the Apanakaksha, that is below the navel area. We palpate that. We auscultate. Auscultate means we put the middle finger there and we make the notes, whether the solid notes are there, hollow notes are there. So we listen to that. That is how we make the diagnosis. So these are our investigative methods, right? So... We, I'm not saying we don't see the reports or we don't rely on the reports. That is a support you to all this. But if this is telling me something and if the reports are telling me something, I don't necessarily go for the reports. I will go, what is this telling me? So that is the sparshan and the prashna. Prashna means obviously the questions that is gives us the lots and lots of the, and that's why my consultation takes minimum 45 minutes to one hour with patients because I need to dig right from so many patients get fed why you are asking about my childhood I have now the problem well you are the same person isn't it so I need to ask about the childhood simple example if you had as a child chicken pox impact of that can come later on into the life and you can have the psoriasis my clinical experience I'm sharing with you if you had basically a fever which was as a child it was a treated then impact of that come into the skin conditions now. Or if you are asthmatic, then you can have the eczema now. Or if you are eczematic as a child, you can have the asthma now. It is so much to do with your childhood. It is so much to do with your mother and father's constitution. So these are the diagnostic methods which we do uh, use. And the first thing is the Dashavid Pariksha, which are the 10 modalities which we do use for examination, which are what? Dusham desham balam kalam analam prakritim vayaha. What does that mean? Dusha, which dosha, in which area, where do you live? You know, what do you eat? What is your occupation? What is your uh, basically lifestyle? All that we dig down and then we correct all that because our intention is cause needs to be eradicated completely to, you know, resign the effect. So these are the, some diagnostic methods. And I would like to give you a little bit of uh, uh, you know, information about how do we approach towards the treatment. So there are the two treatment modalities, mainly shamana and shodhan. Shamana means the palliation, shodhan means the purification. So the whole allopathic medical science is actually is only one modality of this. And that is the shaman, that means the palliation. Blood pressure increased, take basically amlodipine, that is fine. Acidity increase, take omeprazole. Constipation, take this. 
diabetes take this shaman just suppressing and that's why if you see the you know i i don't know about 60 years old if you see the prescription there are 10 and 15 of the different different medicines that is not the treatment that is the management is happening it's the suppression what ayurveda talks about is the shodhana shodhana means purification purify the cause into the body actually and that's where the ayurveda's most famous part comes that is called as the panchakarma which I will introduce to you. So palliation means shaman, which we do as well with the Ayurvedic herbs, with the different different diets, if needed. But if we find the element is very chronic and shodhana is in, uh, needed, you know, throw the thing out of the body. Vata is creating the problem, Pitta is creating the problem. So I'm taking the antacid. And what I'm saying, look, Pitta is too much in your body, throw it out. So I do actually the diarrhea, that means the virechana, throw it out of the body. So that is the shodhana, that means the purification. So in Ayurveda, you know, we do use the different, different types of the herbs and medicines, as you can see on the screen. We do use the powders, we do use basically tablets, asavarishtas, which are the fermented, naturally fermented forms of the things. Kashaya means decoctions, just like the herbal teas, as you know, in Chinese medical science, that is very famous. Various kind of the ghees we do use, various kind of the avleha. Chavan prash is one of the very uh, uh, famous one in that. Various oils, putting the things onto the oils, simply applying the medicinal oils, treats many uh, um, uh, conditions, particularly skin conditions, stress-related conditions, ointments. We give the in-depth diet and we give the in-depth vihar as well. That is the lifestyle. Now I would like to take a little bit uh, minutes onto this, which is the panchakarma and the most famous and the most important thing, which is this, the purification part of the Ayurveda, which means the vaman, viration, nasya, basti, and rakta motion. Vaman means the vomiting, actually, scientific emesis. And this we do use when the lot of kapha problems are there, kapha related problems. If there is the problems related with the respiratory system, accumulation of the mucus, to be honest with you, my personal opinion is. If every person into the world and universe follows the regime of the Ayurveda and takes the woman once in a year, we would have not landed in this condition which we are struggling with the current condition. Because woman is the process which takes out the mucus which is deeply rooted, you know, in our cells of the body, which is the kapha. And this saturation of the kapha is creating the problem, whoever the COVID patients are and struggling, you know, gasping for the life. Vamana is the basically whoever is healthy the vamana can prevent that actually virechana is basically the diarrhea so wherever the pitta related concerns are there we do use the virechana nasya means putting the oils and different different herbs through the nose we do use that for the urdu jatrugat vyadi any uh, health related conditions related with the brain we do use that basti means enema enema means pushing the oils and the decoctions through the rectum inside the colon to work where to work onto the vata so all my arthritis patients all the rheumatoid arthritis patients chronic if they are the basti is the treatment that's what we do use in our clinic and the rakta motion which i don't practice because of the laws and regularities but in india that is a very regular practice rakta motion means blood letting actually if the blood gets toxified then we need to let the blood out this is the beauty and this is the gift of the ayurveda to the world and we should all you know uh, experience this and we should purify our body so that you don't get diseased and if you have the conditions to purify that this is the tool and this this is such a well i, I always say these are the missiles of the ayurveda you know which can uh, you know break down any critical pathologies famous therapies are there which are on the screen of you but this is not only the ayurveda this is the uh, well marketed part of the ayurveda and well known part of the ayurveda which treats many things which many of you must be knowing already. I don't want to just go in depth of that, but these are the many important things. Abhinga means full body massage. Shirodhara is the oil flow onto the forehead, which is very useful for the anxiety, depression, and mind-related conditions. Kizi, which is a hot herbal bag massage, as you can see onto the screen. We do use that for the number of uh, you know uh, conditions related with the joints and the muscles. Navra Kizi, we do use the rice bag massage for the nerve related conditions into the stroke, into the uh, uh, number of, uh, you know, sciatica related conditions as well. Kativasti is sciatica or spondylitis, lumbar spondylitis for that we do use. Udvartana we do use for the weight loss. Tarpana we do use for the eyes. 
I have uh, basically experienced very good results with the diabetic retinopathy. I have treated many patients <coughs> with the tarpana. So many therapies are there. We do perform number of uh, num more than 30 different different type of the therapies. So this is one of the important part of the Ayurveda as well. So just to sum up and just to come to the end, uh, what we do offer is we do offer the consultations. We do offer the Ayurvedic medicines, Ayurvedic therapies, diet and lifestyle recommendations, detox programs, of course, very tailor-made and very to the point, what is the intention of the detox? And uh, I do run the Ayurveda Academy for those who wants to know more about the Ayurveda and understand in depth uh, about this Ayurveda as well. So Ayurveda is something which I have started, you know, uh, with the intention of giving much more what I have understood. So our team has grown to like four Ayurvedic doctors now and the eight massage therapists. Uh, so far, so we have, uh, you know, our own uh, formulas and own remedies, more than 300 uh, medicines actually for the different different uh, uh, health conditions. We have the five therapy rooms and one consultation room. And so far we, I have treated, it's not only me, it's the team of the Ayurveda, Ayurveda has treated 13,000, more than 13,000 clients so far. We are collaborated with the two pharmacies. Uh, one is the CKKM, which is into the Kerala. And recently we have collaborated with the Akshar Pharma, which is into the Gujarat. Uh, with them, I'm launching the uh, herbal juices, pure herbal juices uh, uh, soon actually, and some of the Ayurvedic herbal uh, products as well. So I'm trying my level best, uh, uh, you know, to promote the Ayurveda because this is the pure medical science. This is our culture. This is our science. And this is not only for the disease. This is not only for the health condition. This is a way of life. So I welcome you all on this way of life. I welcome you all on this path of life. Don't come and see me when you are only having the X pains problems. Come and send me if you don't want to have that in the future. And I'll be very happy. I will be very happy to see you that way. That's why. That's what my wish is actually. I realize for everyone, irrespective of religion, irrespective of your ethnic origin, irrespective of your beliefs. Ayurveda is a nature's medical science. As long as we are human beings, and as long as we are the part of the nature, whoever is in the nature, just to share with you, Vruksha Ayurveda is the part of Ayurveda. That means to treat the plants and trees and to, to solve out the problems of that. You know, there is the part of the Ayurveda which helps for the, you know, the animals as well. So the Ayurveda is not for us only. So don't misunderstand, give the clear message. Ayurveda is for everyone. So... I will stop here a few glimpses of our Ayurveda center just to let you know we are best in Hounslow and uh, I will like to thank first of all to Bhavesh who introduced me to uh, Ayurveda Seva Sangha. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Arun Patilji from the Haro Shaka and I would like to thank all the delegates here uh, to uh, giving me this opportunity and connect to you such a wonderful Sangha. I have seen the slides and I was connected to the Sangha when I was into the Pune actually. I'm from Pune. When I was a child, I was connected, but uh, somehow I was uh, away from the Pune and uh, I was disconnected. But uh, I'm getting connected through this media, which for which I'm very, very happy. I uh, hope everybody uh, understood a little bit what I wanted to uh, convey. Uh, I mean, you know, what my understanding about the Ayurveda is. I hope uh, you have got the right message. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, uh, Dr. Abhijit. And it is really nice to uh, know about the, the depth of the Ayurveda. Uh, we have uh, quite a few questions. Uh, now I would like to take around at least four or five based on the time and how much time you, you know. They, I'm fine. Need some I'm, details I'm on fine. It. So I'm happy uh, to If I can it. start with the first question. Sure. Uh, okay, thank you. So there is one question in terms of the research that you talked about in the Ayurveda. Uh, is there a current research being done with Ayurveda and what are the recent breakthroughs uh, that, have, that have been taken place in the Ayurveda in, in terms of the research? Yeah, so basically, you know, all over the world, the research keeps happening, to be honest with you. What happens is those researchers, they don't get the correct platform to come towards the world. I would like to take your attention to one of the renowned university, which is the Jamnagar University of Ayurveda, which is into the Gujarat. That is a very, very important university and where very authentic and most important researches, they do happen. Second university is the Banaras Hindu University, BHU. A lot of authentic and very important researches of the Ayurveda does happen uh, over there. So you can go on their website and you can just simply, you know, download. 
also there is an ayurvedic uh, uh, you know research journal where we uh, feel very proud to you know uh, represent our uh, research papers i, I was uh, given uh, that opportunity which uh, for which my research was on to the degenerative changes into the bones and effect of the navni that means the butter on to that that so these uh, these are the accesses i mean there are so many websites as well research journals are there time to time the publishment does happen publications do happen but what happens is uh, into the uk particularly we don't have the much more access or we are not well known to it for that uh, but these are uh, uh, available to read even simply if you google with any topic research you will find the research papers the most uh, uh, easy to understand researchers if you want to go uh, and uh, find out the best website is the himalayas website himalaya is one of the manufacturing company and they do display their webs uh, you know researchers in a simple words not very technical ayurvedic words simple words so you can find the researchers so and continuous researches do happen these researchers are not biased researchers sometimes people do think oh they are the biased not at all they are the authentic researchers and i'm very happy to share with you a lot of research is happening into the uk as well with the ayurvedic herbs uh, nowadays middlesex is the university which is uh, which has shown a very good uh, you know uh, like the they have come step forward to give us the platform to uh, come and do the research and we want the ayurvedic herbs to get research on to the uk protocol we want basically mhra to regulate that and we want the ayurveda to come to that platform so that ayurvedic herbs should be understood on to the research levels as well mhra is the regulatory part of the uh... MHRA is yes, MHRA is the regulatory part of the UK, which regulates all the herbs and medicines and everything. And we want that to be happen with the Ayurvedic medicines. At the moment, uh, it's not happening because, as I said, like you know, Ayurveda is a very uh, uh, corner cornered medical science at the moment. I mean, uh, because of the lack of evidence according to the MHRA's expectations. But we, uh, with the Ayurvedic Practitioners Association, we we. time to time we try to you know approach but the researches which happens outside the land like in india and researches what happens inside the land in the uk they they have the different weightages and different approval uh, you know uh, methods so we want more and more research to happen here in the uk yeah thank you thank you there is a next question um, you talked about uh, vata pitta and kapha can two dominants at the same time like vata and pitta or they or they are mutually exclusive no always actually in the general practice and everyone there will be hardly anyone who will having the one dominant only there are very 20 to 30% people into the population will be like that usually 60 to 70% people always show vata pitta pitta kapha or vata kapha it is like that it's like that so oh. we yeah, and we need to try and understand once the vata pitta constitution is there among which what is dominant and what is doing what accordingly we need to treat that yeah i think there is one follow up question the same how do we find our pravritti that is vata pitta or kapha uh, is is it again as you mentioned on the pulse yeah. or other in yeah pulse is one of the most important uh, method to identify the prakriti but uh, mm-hmm. i can give you simple hints you know take any part of the body and you can these are the characteristics there are the typical characteristics i mean uh, on the zoom i can see some faces and i can quickly channelize and i can tell you roughly who is of what prakriti how i can tell you i will tell you vata person they don't put on the weight kapha person they easily put on the weight all right pitta person they are slender one of the uh, uh, definition just to make you understand pitta person can get angry very quickly kapha person can hardly get angry and vata person can get angry and can become very happy easily this is the vata person right pitta person cannot tolerates eat appetite when they are hungry they can get angry they need the food then and there kapha person he can go without the food for long time vata person depends sometimes he is very hungry sometimes he is not so these are the some characteristics into the you know for yourself to understand you know vata person is the full of energy whoever you see like michael jackson is a classical example of the vata you know full of energy vata person they are like that pitta person they have the steady energy they have their certain stamina beyond the stamina they cannot do but they never underperform as well mm-hmm. kapha person they are the most lazy person the person who is sitting on to the sofa and don't want to come out of they are the all kapha person so these are the ways now 
we don't diagnose into the clinic based on this. We don't ask, oh, do you sit onto the sofa and watch? This is not the way. It is just to make you understand. These are the typical characteristics of the water, pit and kapha. The real way of diagnosis of the prakriti is the pulse diagnosis. And most importantly, Agni. Agni is the one, you know, uh, which we need to diagnose. The 13 Agni is what I told, talked about. That is the real tool. And then there are the characteristics of the like hair. There are the characteristics of the skin. You know, curly hair is the vata characteristic. Beautiful and long and strong hair is the basically kapha characteristic. Thin hair is the pitta characteristic. So, so many different, different ways are there. Okay, thank you. Thanks. The next question is on, uh, on more of neurological. Does Ayurveda treat neurological disorders? Yes, it does actually. Depends on what neurological conditions we are talking about. As I said to you, if the correct diagnosis is done and if the correct in the correct stage and the correct condition, if the patient comes towards the Ayurveda, I'm not saying me only, anywhere into the world, whoever the Ayurveda practitioners are, please approach them and get that corrected, uh, you know, uh, confirmed. So neurological conditions are treatable. Bell's palsy, just to share with you, you know, I have treated, I'm, I'm at the moment, I have the three patients of the Bell's palsy. Stroke is the very uh, common, commonly, you know, patients, they do come uh, stroke patients to us. We do treat them actually. We do see a good improvement into that as well. So there are so many neurological conditions. Migraine, simply very common, you know, uh, I, I almost daily I do see the migraine patients. So it is effectively treated by, to the, by the Ayurveda. I'm not saying everything is treatable up, uh, by the Ayurveda because Ayurveda does face the attention towards the asadhya. There are so many conditions which are asadhya, which is not our adhikar, that is Dhanvantari's adhikar. Dhanvantari is the god of uh, Ayurveda actually. So we always say to the treat our patients, honestly, like this is my boundary, and I think you are beyond my boundary or beyond basically my understanding of the Ayurveda. I dare, I, I do not dare to say Ayurveda cannot treat it. It's me who cannot treat it because it's beyond my understanding. And I have to be honest within that boundary. And it becomes then Dhanvantari's Adhikar. If someone can treat, that's great. But if it's not, then I, I have to tell honestly. There are many conditions like that which we cannot treat. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, there is another question more again and in terms of the understanding of the Ayurveda. Mm -hmm. uh, when trying to learn, is reading enough or should we find someone who is educated in Ayurveda instead? <laughs> you uh, you I, mentioned googling, but yeah. It's... Very good question. I mean, most likely question. I, I, I really like this question. Whoever uh, raised this question, congratulations to them. That shows they are really interested now to learn about the Ayurveda. So the answer to this question is, Definitely, you know, Adhyan is very important. Adhyan means reading the right and the correct scripted book of the Ayurveda. Don't go into the translated books. Always go to the basic authentic, authentic books. Because what happens when it comes to the translation, you know, the Ayurveda is showing into the shloka, the peacock to you. But when it comes to the translation, you know, you will be reading that as a parrot. So don't go to the uh, translated books. If you want to learn the real Ayurveda, go to the shloka, learn a little bit of the Sanskrit and go and read that. At least that is my first uh, recommendation. And second important thing, to learn the real Ayurveda, as I said, dialogue method is very important. That is very, very important. You need to find someone, whoever you can follow or whoever you can uh, um, like be confident with, like, okay, this person knows a little bit of that. Go to that person and start learning. That is the real way of learning the Ayurveda. Otherwise, Ayurveda is not a theoretical, theoretical uh, science, not at all. It's a very practical uh, science and you need to find someone for that. And there is one, one more very relevant to the, to the current circumstance of COVID thing. Mm. Uh, do you recommend anything to help prevention against COVID? Anything for general health, example, mm, Amla, Kai, Tripula, Gucci, step, Steplin or Amla. I think more, more in terms of you know, preventing the, the, the COVID situation, how we can be more immune to build our immune system as well, I think. Yeah, very good question again. Yeah, so see, basically, uh, I have talked a lot about that. If you go on to the Ayurveda uh, website, 
there are already two to three lectures which are like hour hour two two hours long uh, lectures in depth lectures about this topic only like what ayurveda things about the covid are there uh, basically any ways we can prevent ourselves what is the immunity i have talked a lot so i will refer you to there if you go and if you uh, find it into the blog area also onto the youtube if you uh, find my me then you, there are the lectures of that uh, i have conducted many webinars on that but just to answer the question on this platform what ayurveda thinks about this covid in a short while i will let you know it's all about basically you know your immunity and you know improve as you improving your immunity now how you can improve your immunity first of all whatever the world is talking about government is talking about we need to follow that but this is all the external you know the mask and the hygiene and 2 meter distance and all this that is absolutely fine this is an external what about the internal how you going to do that and that is the reason basically where i said you know the detoxification once in a year get the panchakarma done whatever age you are above the 18 years obviously whatever age you are whatever the uh, you know your ethnic origin is detoxify your body follow the daily regime which is very important like you know what you should be doing during the day what you should be doing during the night what time you should eat what time you should pass the motion what time you know you should sleep very important the rutu charya is very important you know according to the season we need to change our diet our lifestyle we just change the clothes according to season we don't change our thoughts and we don't change our diet we need to do that this is the basic based on that of course the vyayam and exercise everything comes but the most important thing is there are certain herbs which works wonder which really works wonder already the in the question those herbs have been named guduchi is my priority always you know guduchi tinospora cordifolia that is the latin name of this herb and that boosts up actually our immunity that gives the nourishment to this seven dhatus which i introduced to you and that will make you capable now there is no research so far which states okay if you take the guduchi then you are prevented from the uh, covid i am not saying that what i am saying is you are wearing the mask so why don't you take the guduchi it's like an internal uh, you know uh, way just to share with you there are so many other herbs as well you know chavan prash if you just know about the chavan prash chavan prash is the respiratory systems rasayan that means the chavan prash gives the basically very standard and very effective uh, protection to your respiratory system particularly that's what we need to protect it pippali the pepper basically you know like uh, that is one of the another herb amla that is one of the another herb so many things are there nasya daily nasya regime putting simply basically the sesame oil or the almond oil daily into the nose that will prevent you from doing many things you know so lot of in depth uh, uh, i have talked about all these uh, home remedies as well including the turmeric and including so many other so please go on there follow that and you know you can get more in depth uh, answers for that okay thanks dr ji hope we have some more time there are uh, another three four questions are you uh, sure, sure so there is one more question more uh, again uh, is ayurvedic a cure for cataract problems is there ayurvedic cure for cataract problems yeah sir yeah yeah i i will explain to you so if the see the simple thing is there as i explained to you you know the eye surgery is the is the gift of the ayurveda actually so the cataract surgery used to happen at that time shishruta has invented that now we are in a uh, 2021 and i need to tell you what is the real solution now so if the cataract is getting matured basically the best thing is like you know there are the two approaches for that depending on to the stage of the uh, you know the maturation of the cataract whether we can slow down the maturation or if the maturation is already happened more then we can you know wait and aggravate that to get the cataract completely mature these are the two ways ayurveda you know talks about uh, the uh, imagine uh, we examine the eyes and we are seeing the cataract is just started getting mature so we can slow down its maturity so that you can keep getting the maximum time the vision but if the cataract is already 70 80% matured already there is no point basically slowing it down so better is to get that maturated actually and then get the surgery done because then that becomes again the you know like a surgical uh, case so there are the herbs there are tarpana which i said to you you know tarpana is one of the therapy into the ayurveda in which what we do is we make the dough around the eyes and we put the ayurvedic medicated ghee 
typically we do use the trifala ghee that does helps into the cataract there is a, a wonderful uh, herb called as the saptamrut loha which is comes nowadays it comes into the tablet form i do use that into the cataract patients as well if we want to slow down and give the more and more nourishment so yes there are the ways to deal with the cataract actually okay thank you uh, one more question i think you already answered how often one need to go through panchakarma you were saying annually at least once yeah so that's right so for a healthy person just like me i personally do myself every year into the january that's my regime you know uh, i have decided that so not to get anything panchakarma needs to be done once in a year but it depends on your constitution and it depends what type i mean what needs to be done because you don't need to do every time all the five processes vaman virechan that means vomiting diarrhea and basti not really it depends on your constitution it depends on what usually imbalances you do get once in a year at least you should be doing that is the minimum expectation but if you have certain pathologies to treat then that can be more than that for example if someone is having the arthritis then i need to do the basti treatment more often to that person so what i do to all of my arthritis patients once they i treat them before the winter coming i call them and i start them doing the basti so that they don't get flare up into the uh, into the winter coming ahead it's like that before the hay fever season all of my hay fever patients i call them which i have treated already and i start doing them the nasya so that they don't get basically a uh, problem into the coming uh, uh, you know season of the hay fever so that is how you need to prevent so it depends on person to person but minimum expectation at least once in a year if you are healthy and if you don't want to get any imbalance and any disease at least once in a year and that to find out with the any ayurvedic physician which is close to you near to you known to you like what they should be doing and do that under their guidance only okay thank you uh, dr ji there are few more questions due to i think timing we may have to uh, down this here but uh, you, we have the contacts of uh, dr abhijit ji shinde in, in the in the details that we'll display again please reach out to him as well one final question which has come up i think it's good for everyone's benefit what practical tips can we adopt daily to maintain a good health uh, that will be the good one to close with i think yeah the entire chapter is there in ayurveda that we call as the dinacharya so uh, what it is is basically you know ahar nidra brahmacharya these are the three pillars of anyone's health first and most important thing what i would like to let you know is you know you in your daily routine i mean rather than telling me like you know wake up this time and do this and do this and do this which is important no doubt about that look after what you are eating that's very very important and don't eat just because i like that or dislike that or easy to cook or basically you know like this is okay like this is how i have it not at all try and understand whether you are eating according to the time of the day according to the season of the year according to your appetite which is very important are you eating because you are hungry or are you eating because it's time of the uh, you know time of time to eat according to your appetite which is very important look after the ahar that is very important and if you are not feeling hungry eat less if you are not feeling at all hungry don't eat doesn't matter but don't eat just because it's time to eat okay so ahar nidra nidra is the second important pillar of anyone's health the enough rest is very important nidra means not only sleep actually i am talking about the physical and the mental rest and in the nidra the meditation in the nidra the yoga in the nidra basically actually physical sleep is very very important so don't underestimate the type of the nidra i am not at all giving you how many hours the nidra should be but the quality of the nidra what type of the nidra you are having that is very important and pay the enough attention towards that and then the most important and the third pillar which ayurveda has surprisingly uh, you know to so many people it is surprising how can the brahmacharya is introduced into the these three pillars ahar is the one nidra is the second and then the brahmacharya ayurveda talks highly about the brahmacharya this is the third important pillar of anyone's health actually this is the reason behind that is the sapta dhatu what i am talking about from rasa is the first dhatu and shukra is the seventh dhatu our health is basically you know flowing in between these seven dhatus so if your rasa is very good just because of your very good ahar and if your shukra is well maintained and very good because of your vihara that means your lifestyle and how you have used it throughout your life you know 
then your health will be perfectly balanced between these two dhatus. So your ma, rakta, mouse, med, asti, maja, shukra, that will be getting the equivalent nourishment and none of the dhatu will have the less nourishment. I can give the so many examples of that, you know, vevai, that means basically un, uh, you know, wrongly uh, uh, using uh, the shukra can create uh, so many problems and uh, we do see that into the uh, practice actually. I rather give the immense importance, not only to the physical brahmacharya, to the mental brahmacharya as well. The way you thought, your thought process, the way wow. you think, that is very, very important. And that is what is going to take us to the, not only physical, not only mental, but towards the Atma, the soul, and which is the ultimate aim of everyone's life, you know. So we need to, I mean, understand the body. Through the body, we need to look into the mind, balance the mind. And with this channel, we need to go up and basically, you know, understand the soul, understand the Atma. So this is the tip I can give you, Ahar Nidra Brahmachari. Explore this, read more about this. There are so many books, there are so many things you have to read about and understand this. This is the best thing, not like only daily regime. I do seven days, like, you know, seven days a gym or I do swimming, so I'm healthy. No, <laughs> that's not, that is very superficial. Okay, thank you, thank you, Doctor Ji. Thank uh, you, I think with this we will we will conclude. Uh, apologies, we went slightly uh, beyond the scheduled time, but it was really nice to understand the Ayurveda, as you said, the life knowledge which helps us to you know live healthy, live longer, and uh, you know having uh, good good life for ourselves. So with this, I would like to thank Dr. G for your time and all the knowledge that you shared and to all the our participants who have joined here and stayed with us slightly longer than what we actually planned for it. But I hope this has helped everyone uh, in understanding the importance of Ayurveda. And please uh, do reach out to a doctor if you have any sort of further questions. Apologies again, we couldn't take up all the questions that have been listed. But yeah, please do reach out to Dr. G uh, that we have uh, the, the details shared. And once again, thank everyone for attending this session. Shubharatri, Namaste. <clears throat>
Bless everyone, yeah. That was great. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much, Amazit. Thank you. Thank you very much, actually. Thank